This is KGW News at Noon. We start our newscast this afternoon in Happy Valley, where a group of business owners is dealing with a string of recent break-ins. We're going to show you some surveillance video here from one of the businesses that's been hit in the Happy Valley Town Center. Now, you can't see his face, but owners think that guy you see in that video right there is connected to the crimes. A restaurant called Noodle Man captured that video back on May 15th, and on that same night, there was another break-in just across the parking lot at U.S. World Class Taekwondo. The owner says someone stole documents with personal information, including the credit card numbers of families with students who take lessons there. Some of that information wound up being used on fraudulent charges. After this, you know, what is happening around, it doesn't feel safe anymore in Happy Valley. Like, you know, it doesn't feel like the same it was like a couple years back. Other recent break-ins at the Happy Valley Town Center include one at Pho Ven, uh, that's Pho Ven Vietnamese Bistro, and another one just this past weekend at Pete's Coffee. In both of those cases, someone broke a window to get in. If you have any information about these break-ins, you're asked to call the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office. Now to an update from Southeast Portland. 82nd Avenue is back open this afternoon following a deadly crash investigation. Police shut down Southeast 82nd between Powell and Holgate for hours after a car hit and killed someone who was walking near Eastport Plaza. This happened around 9 o'clock last night. Police haven't released any other details, but if you know anything about this crash, you should contact the Portland Police Bureau. Clackamas County election officials will not give any more updates on the primary ballot count until the official state deadline arrives next Monday. Clackamas County was giving daily updates after the Secretary of State requested it, but then last week the county reported incorrect information in one of their updates. Officials since fixed those errors and say the mix-up did not impact any election results. By Oregon law, all ballots must be counted and certified by next Monday, June 13th. The federal grand jury, meanwhile, returned a new indictment on a seditious conspiracy against five accused members of the Proud Boys. The charges stem from the January 6, 2021 attack on the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. Prosecutors allege the men tried to prevent the presidential transfer of power that day by intimidating members of Congress and law enforcement, adding that it was all organized remotely by a former leader of the Proud Boys. The new documents also show one of the members stole a police riot shield to break a window, which allowed the very first rioters to enter the Capitol. Also in the news today, President Biden has nominated Natalie K. White to serve as the U.S. Attorney for Oregon. White previously served as an assistant U.S. Attorney since 2012, focusing on organized and violent crime in Oregon. White was one of five U.S. Attorneys nominated yesterday. The others were in South Carolina, Wisconsin, Colorado, and California. White still has to be confirmed by the Senate. For the first time in months, Washington hospital leaders held a briefing about COVID. They held it yesterday, and they said that hospitalizations are once again on the rise in Washington state. The latest numbers from the Department of Health show about 500 hospitalizations every week right now, which is up from a low of about 160 hospitalizations back in mid-April but it's still well below the January peak we saw of 2100. Right now, about 10% of Washington hospital beds are occupied by COVID patients. There could be an end in sight for Oregon's latest COVID surge. Infections have been rising for the last two months, but health officials say cases could start declining by mid-June. OHSU's latest forecast expects hospitalizations to max out on June 14th, that's next Tuesday, with 313 patients. That, by the way, is a slightly lower and slightly later peak than previously predicted in OHSU's last report in May. Well, officials are stressing safety at this point as we begin the most dangerous time of the year for young drivers. According to AAA, the 100 days between Memorial Day and Labor Day represent the deadliest stretch of the year for teenage drivers. Oregon numbers show that from 2011 to 2020, 75 people died in crashes involving teen drivers during those 100 days between Memorial Day and Labor Day. That's an average of about eight deaths every summer. Driving instructors say in addition to wearing a seatbelt and minimizing distractions, young drivers should increase the distance between themselves and other cars, and they also need to slow down. 
a large percentage of crashes are excessive speed and not enough following distance. So I always tell people, whether they're teens or, or older drivers, to you know go the speed limit and or you know five under speed limit five under and leave plenty of following distance. AAA also says that parents can help out by continuing to coach and support their young drivers. The average price for a gallon of gas in Portland is up to $5.47, according to Gas Buddy. That's 20 cents higher than last week. Brian Clerkley spoke to some rideshare drivers who have to cover those costs out of their own pockets. For driving Uber and Lyft, I, um, I mean, I enjoy the job and the gas prices hurt. But um, it's like the tips help, you know, people can tip. They understand that, that we're just trying to make it. That's all we're trying to do. Uber and Lyft driver April Berg Davis is feeling the pain at the pump. According to AAA, the national average is 487 a gallon. The average in Oregon is 542. Across the river in Washington, it's 540. And in Portland, it's 547. All of these numbers are record highs. Those prices cut into earnings for Berg Davis, who's been driving for Uber and Lyft for four years. So I will go where the, um, the bonuses are. I chase bonuses, but not. It's, it's hard. AAA says gas prices will continue to climb. The major driving factor is a tight global supply of crude oil. Over in southeast Portland, DoorDash drivers are picking up their orders from what's called a ghost kitchen. Some of the drivers are optimistic despite rising gas prices. It's definitely not the end of the world. Um, DoorDash is still doable, it's still like profitable and everything. It just costs a little bit more money to get started in the beginning of the day, you know? So maybe I have to do like an extra delivery or two to get like my needs met the same way they were like a week or two ago. But other DoorDash drivers say they are taking a huge hit to business because of gas prices. And if prices increase, they might have to make more adjustments. I would probably really be super selective on which dashes I took. The price would have to be very high and the tip high. Back in downtown Portland, Enrique Gutierrez runs a food cart. He says it's been expensive getting to and from work. Oh man, they're crazy. I don't even want to drive anymore. I'd rather take the scooter everywhere in downtown or just not use a car at all anymore and just take the light rail or, you know, it's too much money. Again, that was Bryant Clerkly reporting for us. All right, one more story before we go to Rod Hill and the Weather Center. Some of our viewers say they felt the small earthquake that was centered near Camas last night. It hit right around 7 o'clock, lasted only a few seconds. It was a 2.8 magnitude quake, which is definitely on the smaller side, but still big enough to give people a little jolt there in Clark County. By the way, if you felt that earthquake last night, you can report it through the USGS website. And now we turn to one of my favorite Clark County residents, Rod Hill. Rod, I asked you earlier this morning, you said you did not feel that earthquake did, last night. Did not feel it. We live over just uh, west of I-5. On that map, it was that kind of orange or red dot that's not too far from Lacamas Lake. That was the epicenter of the quake. The depth of it, by the way, was uh, just not quite two and a half miles deep. But those numbers are considered shallow. The quake itself was weak. And most of our reports are people that live in somewhat proximity to the actual epicenter itself. One of those, Jess Marple said, well, we live by Lacamas Lake. It was quick and really shaky. And I saw other reports of that saying that uh, while it didn't last very long and it wasn't extreme, there was definitely, <laughs> definitely enough shaking to catch your attention. Okay, that was last night, right? Shortly before 7 p.m. Well, we started off today with our coast cameras looking gorgeous. I mean, it was sunny blue, but now it looks like this. Here's the Astoria column camera. That's cloudiness that's thickened up. Here's Depot Bay from the Channel House. That's cloudiness down along the Central Coast that is thickened up. And instead of clear, we're kind of getting a milky sky now over downtown Portland. But we have had a nice warm up. We were in the low 50s this morning. We've jumped all the way to 70. So even with clouds continuing to increase, we could get up to 79, maybe 80 this afternoon. And don't forget, if you have plans tonight, there's at least the chance of a little spritzy shower here or there. Most of the rain we're tracking is still a couple days away. We'll talk about that coming up.